No, that's good. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Spring CDAR Seminar. I'm Lisa Goldberg, one of CDAR's co-directors, and it's great to see everybody virtually. Uh, had been hoping that we could see you all in person, but that's not to be right now. We will obviously, like everyone watching the health situation, and we'll start having in-person talks as soon as it's safe to do that. In the meantime, thank you for uh, coming online. Uh, if you're uh, on our mailing list, great. If you'd like to be or know someone who would like to, to get announcements of the seminars, please contact me or Rutor Linders, our seminar administrator, or Sang Um, who's CDAR's chief administrative officer, and we will um, make sure you get all the information. And seminars are always posted on the CDAR website, so you can check there. Today, for our very first seminar of the semester, I am delighted to introduce my friend, uh, David Bailey, who is uh, a researcher at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Uh, David's talked to us before uh, on joint work with Marcos Lopez de Prado. Uh, and the work um, that David's been doing is like really important for me personally uh, on, on the questions about how uh, we do and what we can learn from empirical studies of financial strategies. Obviously everybody in finance cares about that. And I don't think it's on the screen, but uh, if you haven't taken a look, check out David's website, the Mafia, that's M-A-F-F-I-A -F -F website. That's Mathematicians Against Faulty Financial Information. Well, I don't know, it's a good acronym. That's close uh, enough. Uh, I got, yeah, basically to find out the, the truth and uh, what's really going on, best scientific practices. So today's talk, why financial research is prone to false statistical discoveries, um, we'll start now. David, over to you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. So um, I just wanted to mention this is certainly joint work with my uh, collaborator, uh, Marcos Lopez de Prado. Um, who has been at, um, he actually was uh, a leading figure in, a num in some uh, quant firms in New York City. But right now he is in Abu Dhabi uh, managing their uh, investment uh, fund there. Um, anyway, as, as I mentioned, if anyone is interested, the, the talk is on my website. You can download it. And then they, I think you're also putting it on your website there, which is fine. Oh, oh my gosh, there we go. Okay, so um, this is sort of, uh, I just wanted to mention by way of introduction, I, I almost feel a little uh, uh, unqualified here because I, I am certainly a newcomer to this field in the sense that, uh, you know, I haven't done this all of my career. It's only been the last um, five or 10 years, uh, much of it in collaboration with my uh, colleague Marcos. But um, I, I do have some thoughts here that I'm going to uh, share with you and, and maybe some tools and techniques that will be of help. So the question, why is financial research so prone to false statistical discoveries? But I think in part it is due to the nature of the beast. Um, let's face it, uh, a lot of parties are out there combing every conceivable um, strategy and analyzing huge banks of data looking for any kind of um, uh, actionable uh, phenomenon that they can uh, use. And also um, part of a lot of the uh, techniques that are being used are based on the assumption of stationarity, but uh, financial systems are not really uh, stationary, at least particularly over a longer term uh, time horizon. Um, and then it's, it's unlike like in the laboratory in some other field, we can go into the lab and we can run a controlled experiment and we can change the uh, environment or parameters and run it again, but we really can't do that uh, 
uh, with a uh, in finance, we can't go back and change history and rerun uh, historical experiments. So what I'm saying there there are difficulties here, but uh, to me this just simply means that we have when we're uh, doing work here, we've got to be particularly careful with any kind of statistical um, uh, inference. Uh, some more discussion of this. We, Marcos and I have just published a paper or actually just out uh, uh, a week ago that says uh, on this topic that's, and I think this paper is still available on the significant websites, the full, the full text and graphics, but uh, if for some reason it isn't, you can get the uh, uh, preprint at this SSRN URL here. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit um, about this whole idea of reproducibility and, and statistical reliability. This is really rearing its head in a lot of different fields. So here are just some examples in uh, <clears throat> medicine, uh, uh, pharmaceutical research. Uh, you can see some cancer uh, research, uh, some psychology studies, um, economics, um, and attempts to go back and really reproduce or at least statistically reproduce some of the findings in some prominent studies have been kind of disappointing. And um, uh, there's this uh, reproducibility project, for example, uh, at the University of Virginia that's um, uh, been attempting to go back and reproduce some uh, studies in the social sciences. And uh, <clears throat> it's really rather disappointing results so far. Um, and, uh, you know, these are uh, lovely smiling people, but if they knock on your door, it's not going to be a nice day. Because uh, they really reg very rigorously go through some of these studies and, and often try to reproduce the results, often even with, the, with help from the auth original authors. But then anyway, there is bottom line here is that only about half the time can they really uh, re reproduce the results, the main results that are claimed in the study. Uh, this is also kind of a personal issue for me because in my real career, I guess I have two real careers. One is in um, uh, computational mathematics. If any of you, uh, like we've ri I've written some papers on pi, uh, computing pi and, uh, and such things. The other career you might say is in high performance scientific computing. This is mainly what I was doing at the uh, Berkeley lab, but that field, the high performance computing field went through a real uh, crisis of credibility um, uh, a number of years ago. Um, looking back about 1990, when highly computer technology, highly parallel computer technology emerged. And sadly, some of us started to see that even uh, it's not just the, the the commercial vendors of these systems, but even researchers in the fields using them started to kind of get a little carried away and were hyping and inflating claims of performance. Uh, the only problem with this strategy is that there are some uh, nasty people in the field and uh, like me who actually uh, publicize and give examples of of ways where they're inflating the uh, performance. And uh, I made myself rather unpopular for a while by, uh, uh, by these uh, papers and talks. Uh, and sure enough, the uh, inevitable happened. A lot of the original um, computer companies that were in this field collapsed. I don't know if any of you remember a company called uh, Thinking Machines. Uh, and um, at least one, well, okay, I'll say it. The, the CEO of Thinking Machines, I think personally blamed me for the demise of his company. But uh, anyway, finally, um, a little bit more, some higher standards and benchmarks, including some benchmarks that I was involved with um, 
uh, set some better standards for reporting the performance and uh, usability of these systems. And <clears throat> nowadays, the uh, virtually all computers uh, feature this massively parallel design. But the lesson that always strikes me is if a field has sloppy standards or if there is a public perception that does not match reality of the uh, that is known to the first line workers, then it usually ends badly. And so uh, for this reason, I've been a little concerned with some of the things that I've seen in the finance field. There we go. So anyway, here are just a few observations uh, that I have made. I'm sure, again, this may be, I, doubtless is well known to most of you watching the talk here, but uh, it's even the many individual researchers or, or, or investors are now realizing that only a small fraction of investment funds really beat the uh, overall market uh, corresponding market averages, say over a 10 year window. We'll give some examples of, of this later. Um, financial forecasters, uh, again, there are some uh, pesky people that actually keep record of these uh, forecasts and most of them don't do very well. Uh, another concern I've seen is, is the <coughs> uh, usage of what I can only be described as pseudo mathematical jargon um, in the, uh, like, particularly in financial news or in the writings of some analysts. Um, come on, Fibonacci ratios, uh, uh, cycles and waves. I think you all know what we mean, uh, particularly in this, uh, in the arena of technical analysis. There, there's a lot of nonsense being said there. And for that matter, um, uh, even some um, brokerages are encouraging the use of some of this material that I think at some level it must realize is not really uh, statistically valid. But it even in academic researchers, uh, or in research, um, few authors really disclose the full extent of computer searches that were used in developing or tuning a model. And, uh, you know, th this is a concern. So, but again, what, what should responsible finance researchers do? First of all, let's ensure that their own research is, <coughs> is uh, statistically sound. Um, Here's just a example of when I at least first started to, to look into some of this. Um, I, I sent a, a, one day I sent a long winded email to a finance colleague. Uh, well, okay, tell you what, this, uh, the finance colleague here is my, uh, my friend Marcos Lopez de Prado, as it turns out, but I just explore, it just expressed some puzzlement. It says, uh, particularly some things in the in this in the in the field are just really not very rigorous and don't strike me as very adhere to a very rigorous mathematical uh, foundation that we see in um, in some other arenas. I said, you know, am I missing something here? And uh, he had to agree that. Yes, the amount, there's just an, an awful lot of nonsense in the field. A lot of it in the, uh, you might say, the financial news and more public facing arena, but even, even in, in academic research, there's uh, some usage of things that are really not statistically uh, sound. And so a lot of this really boils down to backtest overfitting. And again, I'm sure uh, those of you watching this are quite familiar with what we mean here. This is a, a pretty basic uh, concept, but it still strikes me that this, this is a, an issue in some quarters of the field. Um, um, in particular, I don't, it doesn't seem to be universally recognized that 
when you're developing a model or a strategy or designing an investment fund and you're using a computer to try millions or billions of different parameter via variations or you're using a search strategy to find some optimal design that the process of doing that on a fixed historical data set is very likely to lead to something that's going to be statistically overfit. And so, you know, we've got to, at the very least, we've got to find ways to uh, uh, counter and accommodate and correct for this type of, um, of overfitting. Uh, uh, Marcos and I and a couple other authors, we published one paper on this, uh, which you can you can look here, uh, where we uh, we do, we found results comparing the minimum say backtest length time that you would need if you're trying to various variations of a model, and as it turns out, it really is not very much. For instance, if you have a model that's based on daily market data and you have uh, maybe five years of market data available, you better not try more than 45 variations or you're likely to find at least one very variant of the model that will give say a, 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 a good uh, a sharp ratio say of 1.0 or, or better. Maybe you can find the details here. Hey, hey, David, may I ask a quick question? Please. Um, I, I actually am glad that you pointed me to this paper because um, I'm going, I probably should have read it years ago, but I will now make a point of reading it. My question, though, is that um, that result, the two years and the five years and the 45 and the seven, um, that seems to sort of assume a certain dimensionality of the data, which I would imagine would affect pretty importantly, you know, those, those numbers of seven and 45. Can you, can you talk for just a second on that? Um, well, I, maybe I don't quite understand. Um, uh, can you explain a little bit more? Yeah. So, like for example, if I've, you know, if I have five years of data, but I have three hundred potential variables that I might inspect, you know, one pass through that data will identify a bunch of variables almost certainly that seem related to my outcome. But I would look at this and say, oh well, I still got seven more variations, or sorry, forty or more variations to try. So my question was really about. What's the relationship between the the length of the series and the dimensionality of the of the vector? Well, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know right off. Um, can you send me a send me an email later? I'll see sure. if I can. Uh, yeah, be interested to talk about that. Thanks. Sorry to get you off track. Sure. Um, anyway, well, here's just an example. Whoops. Um, I, I, again, just to sort of underscore that even, even a very simple model design, it's, there are often parameter variations, uh, countless uh, parameter variations. Uh, and if we're using a computer to search for a, an optimal design, uh, it's, it's very problematic. Now, here's just a simple example. Like suppose someone thinks that, um, we, we can design an investment strategy where we uh, buy some stocks on one day of the month and sell them on another day. You know, obviously this is not likely to lead to a profitable strategy, but the point is just even a very simple uh, design like this. Uh, let's look at all the different choices and uh, just for the start and end dates, there, there are over 435 variations. So. Uh, again, it's um, a lot of times there are more realized when we're when we're doing a design like this. So anyway, here's here's another very interesting. There was a few years ago. Uh, uh, There's an article by Brightman Lee and Liu. They said chasing performance with ETFs, uh, as you probably are well aware of, there's really been a plethora of new uh, exchange traded funds released out into the market in the past few years, uh, literally hundreds per, uh, per year. And um, 
And, but there, there are some issues here. Someone did this study where they looked at uh, uh, the, uh, the performance of the model up to the point of when they applied for the SEC for permission to introduce to the market and then subsequent. And they found that uh, the average uh, excess returns over the, the, the market averages for these ETFs was, was 5%, almost up to the exact date that it was actually applied for the SEC and then released into the market, and then zero uh, afterwards. And again, we, we, uh, we can't prove it, but it's, it's it looks very much like a design process was used in designing and these these uh, index funds that involved uh, extensive computer exploration of parameters and weights. Uh, and then when it goes out into the market and and gets new out of sample data, then it's just basically no better than the market averages. Um, uh, again, just recently, uh, uh, a couple of us uh, set out to, to say, you know, exactly how how difficult it is it to design, say, a, a mutual fund of uh, let's just say let, let's just restrict it to a weighted subset of S and P five hundred stocks that will match some desired pro uh, profile. Uh, can we design, can we construct a weighted subset that will, will do this? For instance, suppose someone said, I want a steady 1% per month uh, growth uh, year in and year out. Uh, as it turns out, um, if we, <clears throat> it's not too hard to do that. Uh, you can look at the details uh, here, but uh, what happens in, um, is that when we look at the new, when we present these, uh, these, these stock funds with new data, then the results are, are erratic at best. And, and in fact, they often end badly with the, uh, the, the, the fund losing almost all values. You see a couple examples here. Again, you, if you're interested in the technical details, how we did this, here's the, uh, uh, the paper. Um, another question is what about the active uh, managed funds? I, again, I, th I think many of you are familiar that actively managed funds have not done very well lately. Um, some have. Uh, there are obviously uh, some organizations that are doing very well, like uh, this uh, Renaissance fund, um, uh, the medallion fund from Renaissance has, has just gone up, up, up for 20 or 30 years, but they're using very sophisticated uh, computer analyses. And uh, obviously they are not sharing with anyone uh, what their techniques are. But um, overall, the record isn't very promising. Uh, someone had just did an analysis. You can see the references below for details, but. Uh, over a 10 year period ending in 2019, only, only about 8% of stock mutual funds, actively managed funds in the US large value category uh, beat the uh, corresponding uh, 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 passive index, which I think for, for that was a S and P 500 index. And then there's also the, the same for the growth stocks, again, about the same percentage. World stock funds did a little bit better, but that's partly because of a change in exchange rates. It's not clear that that's really indicating uh, uh, improved skill. What about market forecasters? Well, they haven't done very well either. Again, the problem of being uh, of announcing your uh, 
uh, forecasts is that there are a few people here and there, a few pesky people that actually keep track, or, uh, track of them. Uh, here's one fellow that did a, a rather detailed study of people who have made S&P 500 index forecasts. And, um, and they covered uh, like a 17-year period. And he noted that on some of the critical inflection points in the market, say the recession years 20, 2000 to 2002, and then again in 20, 2008 and 2009, uh, they did very poorly. Uh, and so the rest of the time it was fair, the forecasts were fair, but, but not great. But Kaiser's conclusion was that these forecasts were least useful when they mattered most. Uh, again, you can go to this uh, uh, URL for details if you have a Bloomberg account. Um, so uh, Marcos and I and a couple other authors did a, um, a study of forecasters uh, a couple years ago. Uh, we took a, um, a, a uh, <coughs> study of 68 forecasts done by the CXO advisory group. And then we sort of extended it and advanced this study by we classified the forecasts according to time frame and specificity. We tried to uh, categorize these and see if we could see any uh, uh, any any trends that would come out by by uh, classifying them uh, in this way. But again, we found across all forecasts, the average accuracy was. 48%, which means really not much better than chance. Uh, it's interesting, uh, a handful did very well, but most did very poorly. Here's some of our actual data. And we've actually put the names here of the forecasters, which I'm sure uh, annoyed some people, but uh, like I, you've all heard of Jim Cramer at CNBC, he's here and uh, Ken Fisher, didn't do, neither of them did very well at all. I mean, they were some of the uh, worst ones in the list. Um, um, there's this fellow, John Buckingham, somehow did very well. But again, in the looking at the whole set as a whole, it's not clear whether that was maybe just a statistical fluke, but it certainly among this set of forecasters in general, there's no convincing statistical evidence that there's really any clear uh, skill going on here. Uh, again, just a quick um, uh, summary. Um, here's one other study that was just recently published um, uh, just, just a, a year or so ago. Um, they looked at some uh, a large set of uh, Papers. I mean, I think they analyzed over a, well over a hundred papers that had been uh, published uh, talking about anomaly indicators, and uh, and they when they uh, analyzed these, they they had a tough time finding. Most of these did not really pass statistical muster, quite frankly. Uh, uh, they use somewhat stronger language uh, in the study. Again, again, you can you can go to this paper if you like to see the difficulties. Anyway, so uh, again, this kind of gives me somewhat cause to concern. Is and I even look at some of our of the papers that I've been involved with. Have we really done the statistics right? And um, and what can we do to uh, to be a little bit more rigorous uh, in our analysis. Um, tonight in Marcos and I published a uh, paper actually just November it came out, uh, American Mathematical Monthly. Um, we, we call it the uh, fault strategy theorem. Actually, although the most of the uh, of this was actually uh, in an earlier paper that three or four years ago, but uh, Anyway, just basically looking at the, the uh, 
we note the obvious statement that the distribution of the maximum sharp ratio is certainly not the same <clears throat> as the uh, <coughs> distribution of a sharp ratio randomly chosen among a set of, of trials. And so can we really quantify this? And what does it really mean? And um, basically what we found is that of course, is that the uh, expected value of the maximum sharp ratio steadily increases as a function of the number of trials. So there is no a priori preset sharp level that will, uh, the, or any preset SARP level will eventually be exceeded by some trial that was, was really just random noise. Uh, here's the actual statement of the theorem if you'd like to look at it. Um, uh, basically, uh, it, it, it is based on the, the inverse uh, Gaussian normal distribution and or, or the inverse of the, of the standard Gaussian cumulative distribution, which more and more properly. Anyway, you can you can go to if you want to go to this web to this uh, paper here. You can get the details. And so we did some um, Monte Carlo analysis where we we wanted to sort of pursue this a little bit more. And we generated uh, a large number of uh, Monte Carlo experiments. Anyway, here was sort of the results of this, and. Uh, and here is the, the dotted line is the expected sharp ratio given by this formula. And uh, the, uh, the results here are some are from the, the Monte Carlo distribution. You can see the uh, formula gave sort of the expected uh, uh, level pretty, pretty convincingly. But uh, what's striking on this is that Again, these are all based on trials that are unit are basically mean zero unit uh, variance sort of uh, data. So, uh, but uh, even with uh, say a, a million over a million trials, you've still got some um, trials that are that are giving sharp ratios of uh, up to two and a half, in some cases nearly three. Anyway, just a sort of a, a summary here. Um, I, I think, again, this is sort of, I don't want to be uh, seen as a preaching or to the choir. You probably uh, know some of this, but I, I, when I see some of the things that are being, that in the field that strike me as not really fully as rigorous as they should be, that makes me, kind of feel uncomfortable <laughs> to begin with. I go back and look at some of my own work, you know, is it really, uh, is it really solid? But thinking back to the experience like in high performance computing and some other fields, uh, again, when there's sort of a, a lot of pseudoscientific jargon going on and when people are not really using the most rigorous statistical methods, it usually ends badly. And, um, and so I would just thinking that if those of us in the field, if we have some way that we can be a little bit more vocal about things that are not really uh, top notch in rigorous standards, uh, it's, it's got to help. And here are just some of the things that, that uh, concern me. Um, a lot of this perhaps is really more in the like public financial news and public financial commentators and uh, everyone wants to interview an expert that's going to tell us how the market's heading and uh, I think many of the people who are giving such commentaries really know better that the market may be not totally efficient, but it's pretty efficient. And we can't expect uh, unsophisticated methods to, to beat out the market averages in the long run. But somehow this message isn't getting out to the public 
And some people who I think know better are not being fully candid about things, for instance, that very few, the fact, for instance, that very few funds really beat market averages over the, the long term and that some methods like technical analysis really are not statistically sound and people who rely on them are really kind of kidding themselves. But uh, again, I, I don't know what the solution is here. I don't know what, what can be done, but I just have a, a vague feeling of uh, concern that, you know, this is not going to end well. And so if there's some way, if there's some way that we can, we can do better in getting the, uh, the message out, first of all, within the community of researchers, and secondly, in the larger world of finance, it's, it's got to help in the long run to preserve credibility. So there we are. That's all. Uh, some comments and questions. Well, thank you, uh, David, for for all of that. Um, before opening it up, up to others, I, I have a question about your simulation with the max sharp ratio. Sure. Presumably, there were some distributional assumptions underlying that simulation. Can you say what they were and what happens if you vary them? Well, um, they were. Uh, they were assumed to be independent, and and each each try each individual trial was based on uh, mean zero mean and unit variance data. So uh, you know, we, I mean, it's 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 basically random noise in in the the best way we could we could design. I, I, I guess I'm asking, is this Gaussian or is with there? Sure. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Always Gaussian because. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess as that, I, it's standard normal distributions. Yeah. yeah. As I'm sure you know, financial data don't always look like that or don't ever look like that. Maybe. <laughs> so I'm just wondering what happens to your result if you were to change the distribution. Well, that would be interesting to, to uh, do a similar numerical experiment, with, but with, um, um, say, uh, fat tail data or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me, let me mention this to Marcos. That might be worth uh, uh, some follow-on study, actually. To see, uh, in other words, what I gather though is it would simply ex uh, increase the vertical uh, variance, but it, it's worth certainly worth uh, a, uh, a try. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like fat tail data or data that's uh, not Gaussian in that sense is, is certainly um, rears its head in, in finance a lot. So that's worth that'd be worth an interesting study. A lot, right? That that was one thing. A second uh, thing. This is not a question and a comment, but you're um, said at least a couple times about Fibonacci numbers and waves and all that stuff that we see. Uh, I, it's uh, maybe even worse than you say. And I, it's just an anecdote. Um, I mentioned this sort of thing to to Jordan Ellenberg, who's a mathematician and also an author of, of two books, um, How Not to Be Wrong in Shape. And it, it, he turned the comment into a chapter of his more recent book, Shape, about abuses and crazy stuff. Oh, that's comments. interesting. Can you send me the, a link or something? I, that? I totally will. Jordan's like a, a rare mathematician who gets on New York Times bestseller lists. So he, he has quite oh. a voice. And what he especially... Uh, um, clung to of the stuff I sent him was the CFA Society's uh, uh, chapter on this. So this is not an investor or a hedge fund or anybody with anyone to profit from it. And it's an educational society, Chartered Financial Analysts, one of the most respected mm. uh, um, educational groups. And I, if you'd like, I'll be happy to send you their chapter on fundamental investing, which talks about Fibonacci points and all, it's got all the words you've got here. And this is part of educational uh, material uh, that is 
tested and then these kind of degrees are awarded and then these degrees are prized, CFA level three. Oh my they, gosh, they I, back. I had so, no idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll send that over, but they run um, what I think of as the flagship. I'm noticing all, all your journals, which are great, but the, the kind of flagship publication for uh, academic slash practitioner high level thinking is Financial Analyst Journal, sure. uh, which is their publication. So it could be a really great place to target one of your articles, mm. mentioning their own course materials. I mean, if you're up for that, uh, happy to help make the relevant connections. Oh, uh, you just made my my life more complicated. Oh, good. Uh, good. I, 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 I just as a comment back when I was uh, uh, the pesky fellow in high performance computing and uh, uh, published the. Uh, the benchmark results that made uh, some of the new systems uh, look kind of bad. And uh, and I gave a talk once, it was a plenary talk at uh, Supercomputing 92, which is sort of the, the premier meeting of this uh, high performance scientific computing community. And I gave a plenary talk where I gave examples from uh, uh, peer-reviewed papers in the field and including whose, in many cases, whose authors were sitting in the audience. And I gave examples of charts and, uh, and graphs and arguments and language that was, you know, clearly uh, uh, not really very sound. And uh, I finished the talk and left town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and really, I, I uh, again, and there, there are some, uh, there are some people to this day that uh, didn't like what I was doing, but uh, you know, it didn't matter. But what I'm saying, it's it's not a way to win friends and influence people, but uh, you know, somebody has got to uh, raise some of these potentially unpleasant uh, topics, unfortunately. Yeah, well, they're, they're uh, certainly interesting. So uh, maybe someone uh, else in the audience would, would like to ask a question or make a comment on this fascinating material. Well, let's make a <coughs> conjecture that if you, yeah, sorry. Uh, let's make a conjecture that if you uh, substituted fat uh, uh, tail distributions for Gaussian, it would probably make the expected uh, maximum sharp ratio even higher. So I think it would give a, a stronger signal than the uh, graph you do drew with Gaussian. Well, this is definitely worth worth looking at. Um, oh, let me uh, let me mention it to Marcos, or maybe we can you know get some people to to help. Uh, yeah, I. We, we definitely should try to make make that a more robust or a more thorough uh, analysis on this. And just a quick comment, Lisa. You mentioned um, Renaissance Technology and the Medallion Fund, but have you looked at, or, or I'm sure everybody in the audience is aware, but there are public funds have just you know, not performed well at all recently, and basically everybody's redeemed out of them. So it's just the Medallion Fund that uh, has done well. They're, 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 the stuff that, that we can invest in or, or institutions can invest in has just you know, not done well at all. Well, again, there, there are certainly some instances of uh, funds that have gone up and then gone down. Uh, uh, just in the news recently, there was this, uh, uh, what, Cindy Woods Arc Fund it took uh, really severe hits, but again, I uh, At Kathy Woods or Kathy Woods, yes. And uh, but again, it, that was simply she's taking a very, uh, um, let's say, a very risky strategy, and maybe over the long run, that that uh, investing only on very highly innovative companies will will pay out. So I hesitate to make uh, uh, judgments there, but 
overall, the large percentage of, of these funds don't do that much better than the market averages, and many of them do a bit worse. Uh, so, you know, I almost want to say that <laughs> most funds should go out of business and or at least consolidate. So I had a call. Uh, sorry, this is Roger Stein. How are you? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, great. So, sorry about that. First of all, I, I love this. Thank you very much for a great and stimulating talk. I've been busily downloading your papers as you're speaking for uh, for reference later. I, uh, I've always been troubled by one aspect. I mean, I, I, have, I, I share your views on overfitting and, you know, it's, it's a it's a lonely uh, it's a lonely view to hold if you work in finance, as I do. Um, especially if you build models. But um, one thing that's always troubled me a little bit is, you know, um, we always, you know, consider multiple comparisons and such. And yet, you know, if we're talking about, let's say, the S&P 500 or uh, the FTSE or, you know, any of the other indices one might want to look at, there's really only one observation <laughs> of that index. And everyone in the world is banging away on it. Um, and reading each other's research about what what uh, what people have discovered and so on. So when I sit down, you know, to look at the uh, S and P five hundred, um, I'm not doing it as if I had a, a uniform prior. I've got some strong priors because I've actually been reading all of this stuff and I've read about technical analysis and all these things. And yet, all of that cumulative knowledge that I've endogenized is not in any way part of my. Um, uh, my validation uh, or probability estimates about uh, false discovery. So have you thought, I mean, the same issue comes up with, with cryptography where, you know, there's this notion of side information where you can perfectly encrypt a particular database, but with little bits of information, you can figure out how to link it to another database and all of a sudden nothing is, uh, nothing is anonymous anymore. It's a similar idea. Um, how do you think about this? Well, it's definitely something I, I uh, it's hard to get hands around on something like that. Um, uh, it, it was just, it's worth studying. I just, I for one don't know how to go about studying it. Or how we, uh, I mean, what, what kind of tests or what, but yeah, there's, you're, you're, you're right in the sense that we are, anyone in this field is more than just a machine blindly and objectively uh, uh, looking at stuff. But you know, how do we quantify that, that, uh, that, other, that aspect of it? I, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that if anything, in the presence of those effects, your results are understated. Um, there should be a lot more overfitting if people are indeed, um, you know, learning from each other as well, whether they're learning good things or bad things. Especially with, you know, again, this very limited number of time series to look at in the world and the, the very large number of people that are interested in looking at them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's got to be, there's something there. Uh, I wish there were some easier way to go about studying it. So any other comments or questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I've read similar research and I feel like most of it has been done mostly on the US stock market. Um, and I currently work in a fund of fund hedge fund. So we are also like, we see funds that do stuff like you talk about and my question is, do you think that these strategies might have uh, an advantage in markets that are not the U.S. stock market, maybe less efficient markets? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, that's definitely worth worth looking at. I mean, obviously, there um, 
a lot of other international markets. Um, very definitely, there's there are likely uh, inefficiencies, but uh, uh, again, in some of the the big hedge funds that are really doing this right, the likes of Renaissance Technologies and the uh, um, what's his name? Uh, oh, can't remember the other from the D. E. Shaw. Those organizations, they uh, again, it, to the extent that they will, it is known what they do, which they you know are very tight lipped. But there does seem to be that they are they are looking at other mark other types of um, of finance than just stocks, and they are looking at other markets besides the U.S. So they are definitely finding inefficiencies and exploiting these inefficiencies. Um, so that's uh, definitely something there for sure. Hey, thank you. Any more questions, comments from the audience? Well, if that's the case, David, let me ask, can we post a recording of this? Uh, yes, online? you may, certainly, yes. We, we certainly will. So please, uh, if you'd like to, to share this uh, with others or see it again, please uh, look on our website. Uh, let's thank our speaker. That was fantastic. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, let me mention next week's uh, presentation is Ricardo Fernholtz of Claremont McKenna talking about the universality of Zip's law. So hope to see many of you back for that talk. And uh, between now and then, everyone have a, have a really great week. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.